I'm Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. Now, I know that you spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I am delighted to welcome my special guest to the show today, Trisha Emerson. Trisha, welcome to the show. Thank you for so much for having me. Hey, I'm really excited to dive into a conversation with you. Trisha, let me take a moment to tell our listening audience all about you. Trisha Emerson is the founder and president of Emerson Human Capital Consulting, the largest company in the nation focused only on organizational change. Now, Trish began her career in 1989, helping organizations from Motorola to Marriott, the FBI, the Gap to NetApp perform in the face of transformation. She's a guest lecturer at Haas and Columbia and has presented to many organizations, including Roche, Equifax, Siemens, Coke, Chevron, NCR, and dozens of professional organizations. She's the author of three books, The Change Book, The Learning and Development Book, and the Technology Change book. So Trish, welcome. And I would love to just dive in and start the conversation by asking what key decisions were essential to creating the company that you have today? Well, excellent question. And when I came down to it, I I really had to think about the development of my company in terms of four major areas, Um, how I wanted to form it, how I wanted to grow it, how I wanted to deliver the services, and then how I wanted to go to market. And so at the very, very beginning with forming the company, it was very important to me that I had to, I had to weigh, did I want to be an independent or did I want to actually build a team? That was incredibly um, important to me. Um, also, the notion of how much, you know, how much ownership did I want to maintain in the company? A lot of times I think people take on partners when they probably shouldn't. And, um, and here in particular, I'm thinking, You know, what is an employee versus what is a partner? Right. Um, And then a very, very important criteria also as, you know, an entrepreneur was identifying how much debt was I willing to take on? Yeah. And, pardon? Yes, that's a very important question. (laughs) Well, and it's interesting because when you start a company, it really is very much like going to Vegas. You have to figure out, um, you know, what's, what's your tolerance for risk and when you take the chips off the table. And so it was interesting when I first started my company, I decided that when I got to $10,000 in my own bank account, that's the point where I would actually go back and ask for employment. And the very day, or I'm sorry, it was $1,000. And the very day that I reached $1,000, I actually got a call from my first client. So, you know, so that was, that was pivotal. Um, In terms of how I grew it, there was a real, um, I had to really weigh, was it important for me to hire um, strangers or did I want to hire friends? Hmm. You know, and so that was a, that's a difficult thing because I came up, you know, this is my field. And so many of my colleagues at work were also my friends. And I realized that, you know, and I got a lot of advice saying, hey, don't hire your friends. But at the end of the day, I decided that was actually the right thing to do. And so, you know, but it's also a risk because there's going to come a point where you're going to disagree. And the question is, you know, can you stand firm to your principles when you do disagree? And so that was that was absolutely important. So how did you get into the world of organizational change? And, you know, I want you to put your hat on as the expert that you are to appeal to the potential client in our listening audience. How does one know they need organizational change in, in a company? Well, organizational change is pretty much like breathing when it comes to a company. <laughs> so, so there are two, you know, there are two questions of what you just asked me. So how did I get into it? And the other was, how do you know you need it? Um, I've always been interested in human behavior. And when it comes to what an organization needs to do, it's all about getting employees to respond or behave differently in the face of any sort of a change. So whether it's new technology, a new organizational structure, a new job description, how do you get people to perform differently in the face of that? Um, I've always been fascinated by the field. I started off in communications. And my particular area of focus there was around um, groups and how do you get groups to behave differently based on things like emergent norms. Um, and different messages. And then from there, I went into training. So those things sort of fit hand in glove. And then I was really fortunate to be able to find a career as it was emerging, where it applied directly to business. So, but to me, it's, it's a fundamental, it's like oil in the engine. If you can't get your employees to change, 
you can't be agile in the marketplace. Yeah. And I like that word agile. I, I often use the word nimble. You really, you do have to be so flexible and willing to zig and zag and, and just deal with the realities of an ever changing workplace. So do you think even for new companies, even startups, do you see clients in that realm as well? Because they're changing by the minute. Oh, by the minute. Absolutely. So this is, you know, change is something that applies to startups, to established companies, you know, at the point where you can't change, where you're fossilized, that's when you die. <laughs> I like it. We, we're trying to prevent extinction here. It's <laughs> mm-hmm. exactly so, right. Trish, let's talk a little bit about the biggest challenges that you faced in, in growing your business and how you overcame them. And let me just share that many of our audience members are very entrepreneurial, right? They are consultants. They are hanging their proverbial shingles with a product or a service. So this is really relevant to them as they grow and develop their respective businesses. Mm-hmm. So, well, it depends what stage you're in. So at the very beginning, the challenge was, you know, once again, do I, do I work for myself or do I bring on employees? And, you know, and how do I, the first challenge was making the decision to bring on my first employee. Now, ironically, my first employee decided she'd work for me. Ah. So <laughs> I started off with a contractor who was, again, a friend of mine. And uh, we were actually at Cal about to do a workshop there. And she turned to me and said, I've made a decision today. I've decided I want to be a full-time employee. So, wow. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, so the, the key decision there was to walk towards my fear, you know, the fear of the risk that I couldn't do it. And that was absolutely pivotal. And I think every, um, every major decision that I've made in the company when it came to growth had to do towards walking towards that fear, you know, managing it, making sure that it's a, a reasonable thing to, to take on, but also walk towards it. So going from one to two, you know, 50% growth and then doubling that again and then doubling it again. So, and it's not a straight upward trajectory. And right. I think that's something every entrepreneur needs to understand. It's sort of like the stock market. There are pits, there are peaks and there are drops. Um, the key is that over time you consistently continue to go up And it's also to not look down because that can be overwhelming. Yeah, I so agree. I want to toggle back to something that you said, you know, the question of do I hire my friends or not? And your first, your first colleague, as it were, ended up being a client, right? And I I love that scenario. Did you find as a leader and at that point, a newish business owner that it was tough to manage people that you knew and had a personal relationship with? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I made a lot of, um, very naive mistakes. And it was interesting. So one of the things I did, so I brought in my old management team from a previous employer. And so, you know, again, we had deep relationships over the years. We were friends and colleagues. And so one of the things that I did was because I didn't, I didn't want to say no. And that was a difficult thing for me to say, you know what, I disagree. And at the end of the day, this is where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was, that was a, you know, get on your grown up shoes and this is where we're going to go. So that was number one. But the second thing was, um, I decided to create a compensation structure where everybody was paid exactly the same. Ah. And then the idea was that we would divide the profit. Well, then it was interesting because when we reached the next stage of growth, um, my employees came back to me and they said, hey, equal is not fair. You know, some of us have different experience. We have a different way of looking at things. This is not the right way to be approaching this. And um, so then the challenge for me at that point was to create a, a structure that um, recognized differences in contribution. Um, and tied it contribution as opposed to just base salary. And, um, and then to also recognize the fact that this can't be a, a socialist kind of a, a situation. It really yeah. does have to be on performance. Brilliant. And what I love about that is it incentivizes the achievers, right, to get out there and really bring it. So that's exciting. Absolutely matters. Yeah, mm-hmm. it does. So let's talk a little bit about these amazing books, the change book, the learning and development book, and the technology change book. How did you uh, begin tackling these? Were they written in a trilogy? Tell me more about the books. Conceptually, they were, well, actually, it's interesting. At the very beginning, they were one book. And uh, what happened was, and this is interesting, too, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, because I, one of my first mistakes was to hire too quickly. So I had too many people for the amount of work that was coming in, and I personally was responsible for all the sales. And that's yeah. something that does not scale, right? And so um, we're all in my basement, <laughs> and there were 15 of us sitting in my basement twiddling our thumbs because the work was not there. There was one person who was billable. And so um, I was questioning, what do I do with these 15 people? And so, <laughs> and so um, my thought on that was, okay, what if we were to create a, you know, a set of materials for new hires? 
knowing that the people in our field are already, the people that I'm hiring are already experts. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to create something that was a quick reference because people are very, very busy. So they just flipped to something for inspiration, something that would take up their game. Um, And then um, capture the information that we had in the room. And so, you know, and so that was really the idea. So we brainstormed a number of ideas. And so it really was a collaborative effort. And then, um, and then when we looked at the volume of the thing, and really it came down to me and Mary putting the whole thing together, but when we looked at the volume of it, it was clear to us um, we could really group this into three separate books. So there that's how it came about. And I have to tell you, as a fellow author, I, I love the, the size of the books, the feel of it. I'm very tactical, tactile, so I still love uh, e-books are great, but I love hard copy books. So I write in them, but they're beautiful. Yes. They, they have a beautiful aesthetic. Uh, so I just want to compliment you on that because they really stand out. Well, thank you. And actually, that was one of those things, too, where, you know, we got a lot of feedback in the moment saying, oh, that's not really a book. It looks like a PowerPoint. But uh, Mary and I very much agree that visual is a key to communication. I agree. And I love this. And also the fact it's something that, you know, I think um, Einstein once said, and I really love this. If you can't explain a difficult concept to a six year old, you don't understand it well enough. And so our challenge was to take really deep content and distill it. So very busy people could go there. You know, it's presented in visual ways. So the idea was that it would stick in your brain and that you'd want to look for more. And I also wanted to share that they're, they're different, right? So they stand out. The size, the color, the texture, just the whole feel of it is a different approach. And that alone sets it apart from any other resource out there. So thank you. I really... Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's great. Absolutely. So let's talk about culture, since this is a sweet spot for you in your business. How does culture drive operations and, of course, results? So culture is everything. So the way that we define culture is the unspoken rules by which decisions get made. Mm. So if you personally are not watching the team, how are they making decisions about your clients, about your customers, about the product, about safety? You know, what's happening when you personally are not there? And so it's, it's absolutely everything. And so, you know, and I think it's really interesting because a number of people in business will put together a very robust marketing plan or a very robust business plan, but what they don't do is put together a culture plan. Yeah. You know, and, um, and there is a lot, and this is the other thing too, because there are a number of people out there who view culture as touchy feely. Mm. And so, you know, so they read a vibe and they say, oh, that's the culture and they sort of react to the vibe. Well, at the end of the day, there is so much research, robust research on culture, you know, starting with the, you know, with the area of psychology. Um, one of my favorite authors on the topic is um, Carol Pearson, mm-hmm. and she created this body of work based on Jungian um, archetypes. And so, you know, and essentially, so, it, you know, the, the very work that's used in personal psychology applied to organizational psychology and the idea of, you know, how do you get results? How do you work together? How do you collaborate? Um, and so she'll use the Jungian handles like caregiver or jester or creator, you know, and you kind of know by the handle what that means. And, um, and so let me just give you a quick example here. If you have a caregiver organization and you're asked to install an IT system, okay, um, that has huge implications in terms of how you structure that project. So that means you need more meetings. You need to, um, you know, or in every person organization, you need more meetings. You need to position this in terms of how it's going to help this organization take care of their customers, how they're going to take care of each other. Um, it's longer timelines. It's more interaction. Whereas if you have more of a, a ruler type organization where, and that sounds pejorative, but it's really not in terms of just, you know, how you deliver results. But yeah. I'm going to tell you what to do. You know, I expect you to follow and the company's really comfortable with that. GE is a great example of that. Um, you can be very efficient in terms of time. One's not better than the other. They're just fundamentally essential in terms of how they operate. And what's interesting is that um, the brand of the company creates that archetype. So if I, you know, if I were to say, um, what comes to mind when you think of Coca-Cola? You'll probably describe something, you know, that has to do Mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, uh, all American, you know, innocent, you know, the good old days, something that feels like that. Well, it's going to, it's going to attract people who resonate with that truth. If I talk to you about Google, that's going to, you know. Different picture, yeah. Very different picture, right? And so these cultures become self-reinforcing based on the brand they project. And so you have to be, you have to be aware of these things. And like I said, draw on the body of research that's out there so that you can position your projects and the work itself in a way that's congruent with that. 
So let's take that a step farther. And I would love for you to help the audience understand, again, since so many of them are entrepreneurs, how do you go about creating a company culture, especially in the beginning? Mm -hmm. Well, the very first thing, like I said, it's really important to create a culture plan, in my opinion. So um, the first thing I always say to every entrepreneur who talks to me about this um, is first take stock of your brand. So as an entrepreneur, you are going to attract people to your personal brand because your company brand does not already exist. Okay. So the, so in terms of how you build your team, the first question you want to ask is how do your friends and colleagues describe you? Mm. Okay. The second question you want to ask is what kind of people do you want to attract? And it's really interesting to me because when I've presented this at Cal, um, the students will say to me, Oh my goodness, I am a party person, but I wouldn't hire people like me. <laughs> and so it's sort of an epiphany, right? Right, right. Um, and then the third question is, what qualities do you want your company to be known for? So that's in terms of how you build your team. And then you need to think about how you want your team to work together, right? So you need to ask the question, how do you want people to behave when, A, they're selling your product or your service? You know, B, they know something bad about your product or service. They've got some bad news. Um, C, they have a personal uh, a personnel issue. You know, so um, how do you want them to handle that uh, if they're disgruntled? You know, and so the idea is, or if they have an idea that might benefit the company, how do you want them to behave? So it's all about behavior. Culture and behavior are the same. Um, Ed, Edgar Schein out of MIT yeah. has a really, really wonderful um, way of looking at culture. And essentially his premise is that when a group of people behave in a certain way um, and it's successful, they'll behave that way again. Ah. And they'll repeat it. And the sum total of those repeated behaviors become culture. So culture is habit. Culture is behavior. Brilliant. I love it. I love it. So, Tricia Emerson, you are beautifully prolific in the social media sphere and, of course, your amazing books. Tell us how we can buy your books and also how we can connect with you online. Great. So probably the easiest way to find anything to do with me or the company is our website. And so, um, so that's www.emersonhumancapital.com. Um, Dot com. Um, the blog is on Emerson, I'm sorry, Emerson HC. The mm -hmm. blog is on emersonhc.com backslash blog. Um, we have Twitter, which is um, at Emerson Human Cap. And then, of course, we've got Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. You can just put in my whole full name. The books are available through Amazon. They're also available through ATD. Excellent. Trisha, what a, what a treat to have you today. I learned a lot. I'm so grateful. I hope that our audience uh, buys your books and tunes in with you on social media. Thank you for sharing your time and wisdom with us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It was a delight talking to you. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to Your Working Life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True career and life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. And I'm very excited to share that Your Working Life is now available on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and Stitcher. So check us out all over the internet. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care.